اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم عن جابر بن عبد الله الانصاري انه قال ان فاطمه الزهراء عليها السلام بنت رسول الله صلى الله عليه واله قال سمعت فاطمه انها قالت دخل علي ابي رسول الله في بعض الايام فقال السلام عليك يا فاطمه فقلت عليك السلام قال اني اجد في بدني ضعفا فقلت له اي ذكا بالله يا ابتا من الضعف فقال يا فاطمه اتيني بالكساء اليماني فغتيني به فاتيته بالكساء اليماني فغتيته به وصرت انظر اليه في اذا واذا وجهه ليطلع له كانه البدر في ليلتي تمامه وكماله فما كانت الا ساعه واذا بولد الحسن قد اقبل وقال السلام عليك يا ام فقلت عليك السلام يا قره عيني وسمرت فؤادي فقال يا ام اني اشم عندك راهيه طيبة كأنها راية جدي رسول الله فقلت نعم إن جدك تحت الكساء فأقبل الحسن نحو الكساء وقال السلام عليك يا جداه يا رسول الله يتعظن لي أن أدخل معك تحت الكساء فقال عليك السلام يا ولدي ويا صاحب حوضي قد أذنت لك فدخل معك تحت الكساء فقم فما كانت الا ساعه واذا بولد الحسين قد اقبل وقال السلام عليك يا امه فقلت عليك السلام يا ولدي ويا قره عيني وسمرت فؤادي فقال يا فقال لي يا امه اني اشم عندك رايه طيبه كانها رايه جدي رسول الله صلى الله عليه واله فقلت نعم ان جدك وخاك تحت القصا فدني الحسين نحو القصا وقال السلام عليك يا جدا والسلام عليك يا من اختار الله وتعظن لي ان اكون معكما تحت القصا فقال عليك السلام يا ولدي ويا شاف امتي قد اذنت لك فدخل معهما تحت القصا فاقبل عند ذلك ابو الحسن علي ابن ابي طالب وقال السلام عليك يا بنت رسول الله فقلت عليك السلام يا ابا الحسن ويا امير المؤمنين فقال يا فاطمه اني اشم عندك رايه طيبه كانها رايه اكي وابن امي رسول الله فقلت نعم ها هو ما ولديك تحت القصا فاقبل علي نحو القصا وقال السلام عليك يا رسول الله يتعظن لي ان اكون معكما تحت القصا قال له عليك السلام يا اخي ويا وسي وخي خليفه وصاحب لواء قد اذنت لك فدخل علي تحت القصا ثم اتيت نحو القصا وقلت السلام عليك يا ابتا ويا رسول الله اتعظن لي ان اكون معكم تحت القصا قال عليك السلام يا بنتي ويا بزاتي قد اذنت لك ودخلت تحت القصا فلما اقتملنا جميعا تحت القصاء خذ بي رسول الله بطرف القصاء وأما بيد اليمنى إلى السماء وقال اللهم إن هؤلاء أهل بيتي وخاستي وحامتي لحمهم لحمي ودمهم دمي يؤلمني ما يؤلمهم ويحزنني ما يحزنهم أنا هرب لمن هاربهم وسلم لمن سالمهم وعدو لمن آداهم ومحب لمن أحبهم إنهم مني وأنا منهم فاجأل صلواتك وبركاتك ورحمتك وغفرانك ورزوانك علي وعليهم وأذهب عنهم الرجس وتحرهم تطهيرا آمين 
فقال الله عز وجل يا ملائكتي يا سكان السماوات اني ما خلقت سماء مبنيا ولا ارضا مضيئه ولا قمرا منيرا ولا شمسا مضيئه ولا فلقا يدور ولا بحرا يجري ولا فلقا يسري الا في محبتي هؤلاء الخمسه الذين هم تحت القساء فقال الامين جبرائيل يا ربي ومن تحت القساء فقال عز وجل ام اهل بيته النبوه ومعدن الرساله هم فاطمه وابوها وبالها وبنوها فقال جبرائيل يا ربي اتاذن لي ان اح اتى الى الارض لا اكون معهم سادسا فقال الله فقال الله نعم قد اذنت لك فابد الامين جبرائيل وقال السلام عليك يا رسول الله العلي الاعلى يقرئ السلام ويخصك بالتحيه والاكرام ويقول لك وعزتي وجلالي اني ما خلقت سماء مبنيا ولا ارضا مضيئه ولا قمرا منيرا ولا شمسا مضيئه ولا فلقا يدور ولا بحرا يجري ولا فلقا يسري الا لاجلكم ومحبتكم قد اذن لي ان ادخل ادخل معكم فهل تاذن لي يا رسول الله فقال رسول الله عليك السلام يا امين وحيد الله انه نعم قد اذن لك فدخل جبرائيل معنا تحت القصا فقال لي ابي ان الله قد اوها اليكم يقول انما يريد الله ليذهب عنكم الرسا اهل البيت ويطهركم تطهيرا فقال علي لابي يا رسول الله اخبرني اخبرني ما لجلوسنا هذا تحت القصاء من الفضل ان الله فقال النبي والذي باصني بالحق نبيا واستفاني برساله نجيه ما ذكر خبرنا هذا في محفل من محافل اهل الارض وفيه جمع من شيعتنا ومحبينا الا ونزلت عليهم الرحمه وخفت وخفت بهم الملائكه واستغفرت لهم الا ان يتفرقوا فقالوا علي فقال علي اذا والله فزنا وفاز شيعتنا ورب القابه فقال النبي ثاني يا علي والذي باصني بالحق النبي واستفاني بالرساله نجيا ما ذكر خبرنا هذا في محفل من محافل اهل الارض وفيه جمع من شيعتنا ومحبينا وفيهم محموم الا فرج الله حما ولا مغموم الا وكشف الله غما ولا طالب حاجه الا وقضى الله حاجته فقال علي عز والله فزنا وصعدنا وكذلك شيعتنا فازوا وصعدوا في الدنيا والاخره ورب القابه ان الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا ايها الذين امنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما صلوات على محمد وآل محمد ko fakat be haya 
छोड़ता है जो है दरी विलायत अधूरी शराफत अधूरी अली के बिना है इबादत अधूरी अभी मांग लो तुम विलायत से माफी अली तो बका दे खुला छोड़ता है वो क्या I request you all to join me in this kasida. Apni kismat azma kar dekna, tum maza khana saja kar dekna. अपनी किस्मत आजमा कर देखना सब परो तुम मजा खाना खुद मुनाफिक का पता चल जाएगा खुद मुनाफिक का पता चल जाएगा नारे है दर लगा कर देखना जियो 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 याली अपनी किस्मत आजमा कर देखना तुम मजा खाना सजा कर देखना अपनी किस्मत आस परो अपनी किस्मत आज माँ कर देखना तुम मजा गाना हो अगर जन्नत जमी पर देखनी हो अगर जन्नत जमी पर देखनी कर बलाय बार जा कर देखना तुम मजा खाना सजा कर देखना अपनी किस्मत आजमा कर देखना तुम मजा खाना सजा कर तुमको जहरा तुमको तुमको जहरा की दुआ मिल जाएगी मिल जाएगी पर चमे गाजी उठा कर देखना तुमको जहरा तुमको जहरा की दुआ मिल जाएगी मिल जाएगी पर चमे गाजी उठा कर देखना तुम मजा खाना सजा कर देखना सपरो अपनी किस्मत आजमा कर देखना तुम मजा 
चांद तारे देखना चाहो गई चांद तारे देखना चाहो गई दाग मातम के सजा कर देखना तुम मजा खाना सजा कर देखना खुशबुए रूमाल जहरा चाहिए खुशबुए रूमाल जहरा चाहिए अश्क मजलिस में बहा कर देखना तुम मजा खाना सजा कर देखना अपनी किस्मत आजमा कर देखना तुम मजा खाना देखना And in honor of our twelfth Imam, if you can also join me in this kasida as well. Madad ki chie ya Imam e zamana. Madad ki chie ya. Hata di chhe pat ka. भरे आफते है जमाने पे मोला परेशान शिया कहा जाए मोला पुकारा तुम है जब हुआ दिल जो मुझ मदद कीजिए कीजिए भलाओ ने घेरा नहीं कोई साथी अंधेरा है खै सुदासी है छाई तुम्हारे कदम से हो दुनिया मुन मदद कीजिए या माँ में जमाना मदद कीजिए जो 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 गुनहगार है और शर्मिंद मोला मगर आप पर को भरोसा करो रह परी अपे बराए मोहम्मद मदद कीजिए या माँ में जमाना मदद कीजिए हमें कर बला में हो जाना मया से मदद की जो मोला है दिल में ये हसरत जरी है मुकादस से मदद की 
چیے یا ما میں زمانا مدد کی چیے یا ما میں زمانا مدد کی چیے یا ما میں زمانا پر محمد محمد سلام بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم سید محمد باکر کزوینی سید حسن رزوی ریسپیکٹڈ ایلڈرز جیورس بردرز ان سسٹرز ان ایمان السلام علیکم جمعی و رحمت اللہ و برکاتو فر دا لوف آف آر فورتھ ہولی امام امام زین العابدین صلو علی محمد و آلی محمد So our Fatiha is requested for all marhumeen listed on the screen as well as all other marhumeen. Surat al-Mubarak al-Fatiha. Dua Shafai Maris is requested for all those in need here and elsewhere as well as those listed on the screen. Let us recite together. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويخشف السوء 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 يا الله. The senior subcommittee is planning an event to Kabristan for all. Details will follow soon. Before we move on to tonight's mudzis, we would like to take this opportunity to thank Sayyid Muhammad Bakir Kazwini as well as the servants of Zahra Group for taking the time out of your schedules in order to join us. over the past three nights of celebration and sharing with us your inspiring majalis and beautiful recitations. We pray to the Almighty to accept your efforts and give you the strength to continue serving in his way, inshallah. We would also like to thank Brother Irfan Bimji and Brother Ali Sachu and their respective families for graciously hosting our visiting speaker and reciters during their stays here. Finally, to Sayyid Kazwini and the servants of Zahra Group, We pray that you're able to grace us with your presence again here in the very near future, inshallah. Uh, on that note, let us invite Sayyid Muhammad Bakir Kazwini to please come forward for tonight's majlis. Or Muhammad wa Muhammad salawat. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل السلام والتسليم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين حبيبي إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين إمامنا 
وسيدنا الحجة ابن الحسن المهدي أرواح العالمين له الفدا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد The Almighty Allah states in the Holy Quran بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألا بذكر الله تطمئن القلوب Indeed it is with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the hearts find rest that the hearts find peace Sadaqallahu al-Aliyyul Azim Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad Respected elders, brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I sincerely congratulate you on the birth of the crown of the worshippers the excessive prostrator Al-Imam Ali ibn al-Hussein Zain al-Abideen salawatullahi alayhi Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad May Allah grant us his ziyara and his shafa'a and inspire us with his spiritual light One of the greatest legacies of our fourth Imam is the legacy of spirituality that he gave to humankind if you are searching for any type of spirituality that brings you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seek no further than the university of Al-Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam Allahumma salli ala We find that the Imam alayhi salam truly inspired the world with the spiritual enlightenment that he brought forth, especially after the tragedy of Karbala. That's how the Imam السلام, was able to combat the tyrants of his time. Sometimes you combat the tyrant with a physical sword. Sometimes you combat the tyrant with a spiritual sword. And that's what the Imam السلام, achieved in his lifetime. Today in our era, you find that there are many people searching for spirituality. We are spiritual human beings. No matter how much these atheists tell you there is no God, there is no soul, the human being has been programmed to find spirituality. So you find many people are in search of spirituality these days. We are in search of enlightenment. But we don't know where to find it. Many of our youth are now trying to seek new methods of enlightenment and spirituality. And so what has become very common in our society today is to go to yoga and meditation as means of spirituality. And therefore many of our youth have been asking, what is the religious perspective on these new practices? What is the Islamic perspective on the culture of yoga? This modern type of meditation is this something that we are critical of? Are there good aspects of it that we can borrow? How can I find my spirituality today in light of these new methods of yoga exercises that are being advocated for in our society? Therefore, in our discussion tonight, my dear brothers and sisters, we will examine and critically analyze the culture of yoga, this new culture of meditation, what is our religious perspective on that? And what do we learn from the hero of this night, the fourth Imam of Ahl al-Bayt, Al-Imam Zayn al-Abidin salam What do we learn from him when it comes to spirituality? What is that gift of spirituality that he gives for humankind? Because I tell you, many of us are not aware of the spiritual program of the fourth Imam of Ahl al-Bayt. I guarantee you most of us do not even implement 5% of the spiritual program that the Imam السلام, has offered us. So we will now critically analyze what is called yoga and new forms of meditation in our society today. Now what are the concerns? Why is it that some people, some scholars have concerns with yoga? Let's examine the concerns briefly and then let's give our analysis on that. The first concern that is associated with yoga is its origins. When we look at the origins of yoga, we find 
that it started some 5,000 years ago in northern India. And the first time that we can see the word yoga was used was in the ancient Hindu scriptures, the Rig Veda. We see this word appearing, and basically it was a type of spiritual program, a type of spiritual exercise. So one concern that potentially can arise with yoga is its association with Hindu beliefs, with Hindu practices, because that's where it originated from. That is one concern. Another concern associated with many yoga exercises is that many of the poses and the postures and the positions in yoga are dedicated to different Hindu and Buddhist gods. So when you look at Hinduism and you look at Buddhism and you see their practices of worship, their forms of worship, you see many times they dedicate a certain position to a god. This particular position is aimed at worshiping this god. This other position is aimed at worshiping another god. So that is also an area of concern for us. These positions that are advocated for in society, are they supporting some sort of idolatry or some sort of polytheism of worshiping other gods or not? This is the second potential concern. The third potential concern with yoga and these modern types of meditation is that we find there is a secular effort in our society today to replace religion with these so-called spiritual practices. So when you look at religion, you find that they take the main elements of religion and they repackage it in a secular way to keep people away from religion. I'll give you some examples. Religion is big on prayer. Dua can change many aspects of this universe. This is the power of dua and the power of prayer when you can ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are no limitations. Allah can do anything. This is a belief system that we have in the Holy Quran. In our modern society, how did they replace this? They replaced this with something called manifestation. Have you seen the youth today on social media? They take this manifestation culture very seriously. So I'm seeing sometimes these youth and I'm analyzing you know, how they are approaching manifestation. And they'll tell you, look, anything you want in the universe will happen. The universe will give it to you through the law of attraction. All you have to do is make the intention, want something, it'll happen. And I'm sometimes asking them, how is it happening? Who's going to give it to you? The universe is going to give it to me. And I say to them, really? The universe? Who's the universe? Who are you referring to in the universe? Are you talking about some collection of stars out there? You call them the universe? Is it a planet out there? Is it all of them combined? What exactly do you mean by the word universe? Subhanallah. It's an attempt to replace God with the universe. Just put God out of the picture. Put religion out of the picture. And then you see some very interesting practices too within manifestation. One of those practices is scripting. Write what you want and you'll get it. And write it in a certain way. They have different rules for that. Subhanallah, religion tells you one of the way to get your hajat is to write them in a dua. Or when it comes to the 12th Imam, write the aridha and send it you know, to the Imam salam by putting it in a body of water. You see, they have taken the elements of religion, they've repackaged it in a very secular way. So there is this attempt, peace religion with these new practices. Now in religion we have salah. Salah is a collection of positions, right? You stand, you bow, there is the prostration, the sujood, even the way you sit. Have you seen the believers sometimes when they're sitting in their tashahud? We have the tawarruk type of sitting where it's mustahab. You kind of lean towards your right side. That is a type of stretching during your salah. The beautiful religion of Islam gives you these different positions. But now, let's replace it with these yoga moves. And I can replace religion with anything that I want. This is the third concern. That we find many of our youth today, they are saying, why do I re need religion anymore? 
In religion, you teach me that you need God to get what you want. The universe will give it to me. In religion, you teach me these different acts of salah. I have yoga moves. That will teach me. I don't need the spirituality of Islam anymore. I can find spirituality in some other methods. And that's why today there's a very big movement that's growing and growing. It's called spiritual but not religious. I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. I don't need to follow any religion. I can figure out my own spirituality. This movement is growing bigger and bigger day by day. So these are some very common concerns that we find with the culture of yoga and with this new culture of meditation. I just stated to you what the concerns are based on the analysis of many people. Now let's present our own analysis and see what we can learn from our fourth Imam salam in this regard. When we look at yoga today, my dear brothers and sisters, we find that it has two dimensions. It's critical for us to decipher between these two dimensions. Many people blindly go into yoga not being able to differentiate between these two dimensions. There is one dimension that is basically a collection of physical exercises or certain physical techniques. And it comes with nothing more than that. Such as, for instance, certain types of breathing, right? One very common yoga exercise is breathing. How you control your breathing, how you breathe, how you achieve calmness through breathing, how can you treat your anxiety through breathing. Or sometimes there are different postures or poses. Have you heard of the child pose? The child pose is recommended by many experts and doctors for those who have back pain, for instance. So one part of yoga is simply physical exercises. It's like you run, you jog, you lift weights, you run on the treadmill, you do the child pose, you do breathing exercises. This part of yoga, we don't find any objection to because these are practices that have been proven by many doctors, many physicians, many physical therapists to be truly effective. It's a type of stretch that you're doing. That's it. It's just a physical exercise and nothing more. This aspect of yoga is fine. We don't have any objection to that. However, there is the second dimension that is questionable, that is concerning. And for many people, they cannot separate between these two dimensions. You go out there and you take it as a full package. Many of these yoga classes that are offered out there in society, they combine between this first side, which is fine, there's no objection to it, with other aspects of yoga that are questionable. Because then you find the influences of other ideologies creeping into such programs, creeping into such exercises. I will share with you what's concerning about these practices. What's concerning about these practices is the entire culture of it with some of the elements that they add to it to enhance the experience. For instance, you find that in many yoga classes, there is music to enhance the experience. There are dances that enhance the experience. And many times you find that you have in one class, men and women engaging in these dances. And believe me, many times they're not dressed appropriately. They're, we they're wearing very tight clothing and they're doing all these stretches in front of you. That is not a proper moral environment to be in. Now, when you speak to the youth, you know, be careful about going to these places. What's the matter with you? I'm just going and doing physical exercises. Why are you being rough on me? It's not just a physical exercise. It's an entire package that you're subscribing to. Are you aware what's happening to your spirit and your soul? My dear brothers and sisters, the only way to seek spirituality it's through Allah and Ahlul Bayt because Allah is the one who created our soul and no one other than him knows how the soul functions because the Quran tells us they asked Allah about the ruh through the Prophet sallallahu They ask you about the ruh. What was the response of Allah? 
See, when it comes to many things, Allah explains it. They ask you about prayer, this is how you pray. This is how you fast during the month of Ramadan. This is how you do the Hajj. Allah has explained it to us. But when it comes to the Ruh, what is the response of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي Say the Ruh is the domain of my Lord. That's not your domain. You human being, you can experiment with the physical aspect of your life. You can go to the lab, experiment what works and not. You can experiment between elements and chemicals and see what works and what doesn't work. But when it comes to the ruh, when it comes to the spirituality, that is the domain of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You take what he says about spirituality. You take his program for spirituality because you don't have access to that realm except through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So any experimentation you're doing, you could end up harming yourself, not benefiting your spirituality. So if you're going for these exercises to control your breathing, to relax, that's fine. If you're searching for spirituality, my dear brothers and sisters, I say it with honesty and humbleness because we have more and more of our youth in our communities being interested in these practices and they're being active in these practices. If you're going to yoga and these meditation sessions for spirituality, I say it with humbleness and honesty, you're not in the right place. Who those who are running these classes, what do they know about spirituality? Did Allah give them revelation? Are they going through the Holy Quran or through the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt? That is the only area where you can get trusted spirituality any other forms of spirituality can prove to be damaging can prove to be destructive to the spirit because you don't know what the conditions are for the spirit we don't know what the conditions are for the realm of the soul and the spirituality therefore we have to take only that which is trusted that which your manufacturer knows and who's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is a very important point my dear brothers and sisters now, some people will tell you, but I went to these programs. I felt good. I felt spiritual. That's the deception. You think you have become more spiritual. But that can be only an illusion. Just like music. Today, my dear brothers and sisters, look at experts. Believe me, there are even doctors. They tell you music is good. Go listen to music. Music changes your mood. Music lets you relax. But then look at the statistics. Prolonged exposure to music, what does it do? We have a beautiful hadith from the commander of the faithful, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. In which he states, Prolonged exposure to singing music industry, right? It leads to faqr. What's faqr? Poverty. I remember once a young man came up to me. He told me, Sayyid, do you really believe in this stuff? Astaghfirullah. He calls the hadith of the Ahlul Bayt stuff. I told him, what do you mean? He says, do you really believe in this hadith? I said, yes, it's from the commander of the faithful. Of course, I accept it. He said, but it doesn't make any sense. I said, why? He says, how does it lead to poverty? Look at the singers and the musicians. They're the richest of the rich in our society. And they have all that attention. They have all that following. They're rich. How does this hadith state that they're poor? I told him, you've misunderstood what the imam here means with poverty. You're looking at poverty only from a materialistic perspective. That's not the meaning of fuck and poverty. Come to the statistics, I'll show you. I told him here in front of me, Google this research. Google these statistics. The UK did a study on depression, anxiety, and suicidal thoughts, suicidal rates in the UK. They found that the average population, on average, 19% of the British population suffer from depression as a disease. You know, sometimes we get depressed for a few days, for a few weeks, and then we're okay. That's not a disease, but sometimes it becomes chronic depression. That's a disease. So 19% of the British, they suffer from depression as a disease. Then they looked at subcategories. Let's look at engineers, let's look at doctors, let's look at actors, let's look at singers and musicians to see what are the rates of depression amongst them. 
This study done by the UK government, an official study, you can Google it. It revealed that while the average population, 19% of them suffers from depression, when they looked at musicians and singers, they saw that that figure was at 74%. 74% of musicians and singers suffer from depression and suicidal thoughts and anxiety. And they have one of the highest rates of suicide in society. Why? Money, they have all the money. Fame, they have all the fame. Following, recognition, they have all of that. What's missing in their lives? Subhanallah. Spiritually, they're depleted. Spiritually, they're faqir. They have poverty. Now you understand the hadith of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. So it's very important. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. So don't be deceived by, by the outside appearance. They tell you, come, I'll give you spirituality through yoga. You don't know what you're subscribing to. Maybe in the beginning it feels good. You feel high like a drug. But then over the years you could be damaging your spirituality. So that whole culture, my dear brothers and sisters, of having music, of having dances in one classroom, that is something we are critical of. Even today, our youth go to the gym, they have to put something in their ears, you know, those ear pods, and they have to listen to music. Subhanallah, see what the shaitan is doing to our society. You're going just for a physical exercise, but you can't do it unless you put music in your ears. This is the culture that has been created in our society today. I know some youth, they say, Sayyid, I can't work out without my music. I can't do it. It's just not possible. Really? You cannot do it? Who told you you cannot do it? How many times have you really tried it? Or are you just going with the flow? So this is one area, my dear brothers and sisters, that we are critical of. We have to decipher, be smart, decipher between these types of yoga. Those strictly physical acts like breathing techniques and certain postures, that's fine. We cannot, you know, find it all objectionable. But when it comes to the full package where you're going there for spirituality, that's where it can be destructive. That's where it could generate an unhealthy spiritual sphere and you don't even know about it. You think you're going there to be spiritual. And then many times, many of these spiritual exercises, they involve the manipulation of the brain. You know, the brain has waves. You have the beta waves. You have the gamma ray waves. You have the alpha waves. They try to manipulate that. Now engage in this meditation and you will go from beta to alpha. Beta is when you're completely conscious and you're thinking. Whereas the alpha is when you're more relaxed. Let's do that for you. Honestly, when you're going into that realm, you don't know what you're getting yourself into. Maybe manipulating these waves, brain waves, in that particular way, not coming directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Ahlul Bayt, that could be having a negative influence on your spirituality in some way. Just because you initially feel good does not necessarily mean that this exercise is good. Because again, it could be an illusion. It could be like a drug that when you take it, you feel good, you're high. But then over time, it leaves a negative consequence on you. So this is an area, my dear brothers and sisters, that we need to raise more awareness about. I say this because today our Muslim communities are embracing yoga, are embracing meditation. Many of our youth are flocking to these programs. But we're not able to decipher what's healthy, what's not healthy. But if you're looking for spirituality, go to the door of the hero of tonight. Al-Imam Zayn al-Abideen salawatullahi alayhi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. When you look at the school of spirituality of Al-Imam Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salam, you see that the foundation for it is one that is intellectual. The meditation and the spiritual practices, if they're not based on a strong theological and intellectual foundation, they are not godly. They are not divine and they will not take you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I will say this firmly. That's why the Islamic meditation is one that is based on tafakkur. In the modern type of 
meditation. Sometimes for an hour you do nothing. Sometimes I've asked those people who meditate for like an hour, two hours. I have a friend in Michigan who was interested in this whole meditation thing. And he told me, say it on the weekends, I feel great. I'm doing this meditation for two hours on a Sunday. I told him, okay, explain it to me. What happens during this meditation? When you close your eyes and you're sitting in that, you know, signature posture, right? What exactly are you thinking of? He says, Sayyid, I don't think of anything. For an hour, I don't think of anything. I remove the mental chatter from my brain. I put everything out and I don't think of anything. I told him that's not Islamic meditation. The Islamic meditation is every moment you're consciously thinking of the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're consciously thinking of yourself and your day and you evaluate yourself. You evaluate your sins and your deeds. We don't have any hadith from the Prophet or the Imams or any of their righteous companions who sat there for two hours doing nothing. Where are you getting this from? In fact, when you sit there and you're doing nothing, I think you may be even opening a window for shaitan to come and whisper into your brain because you've emptied it for him. What's the intention behind that? That may not be purposeful meditation. Meditation in Islam is based on tafakkur. Listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in Surah Ali Imran. In these beautiful verses, and I want you to know the context behind these verses, my dear brothers and sisters. On the night of Hijrah, the Prophet ﷺ goes to Quba. Imam Ali السلام, and Lady Fatima and his mother Fatima bint Asad and Fatima, the daughter of uh, Zubair, their cousin, they stay in Mecca. After the Imam السلام, fulfills his responsibility, he heads with the Fawatim, with the three Fatimas, they go towards Quba. As the Imam السلام, goes from one village to another village, as Lady Fatima السلام, goes from one village to another village, going north towards Medina, they contemplate. They see the beautiful night. They see the stars in the night. They begin to engage in purposeful contemplation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that in Surah Ali Imran, that when you look at the universe, how the night comes after the day. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you these signs. These signs are for who? Li'ulil albab. Those who have the intellect. What does ulil albab do? al What do they do, my dear brothers and sisters? We've memorized this verse in Surah Ali Imran. What do they do? The ulil albab, what do they do? al yadhkurun Allah. Number one, Allah has to be there actively. When you meditate, the first thing on your mind is Allah. Allah is the center of the universe. Allah's presence is here. الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَىٰ جُنُوبِهِمْ While standing, they think of Allah. While sitting, they think of Allah. While lying to their side, they think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَيَتَفَكَّرُونَ that's the meditation they engage in. Tafakkur. They contemplate this universe, this creation. Oh Allah, you have not created this in vain. Subhanaka, glory be to you. Protect us from the fire of hell. This is the meditation that Imam Ali السلام, and Lady Fatima engaged in. When they arrived in Quba and they met the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet told them, Allah revealed these verses in Surah Ali Imran in your honor, Ali and Fatima, because on your migration, you were thinking about this universe. You were doing contemplation in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah found it so valuable, he put it in the Holy Quran. That's the beauty of the Ahlul Bayt. So no, when you read these verses, remember they're tied to Imam Ali and Lady Fatima alayhi salam. So the meditation that we find in Islam is purposeful, it's objective, and it's based on a solid intellectual foundation. Now come to Sahif al sajjadiyah and Risalat al huquq the treatise of rights of the fourth Imam. You see that he teaches you purposeful meditation, but it's based on an intellectual foundation. You have rights. 
The first right starts with Allah. As you're meditating, tell yourself, I don't own my body. I don't own my life. I can't do whatever I want with my body. If I do what I want with my body, I'm committing theft. Because that's not your body. This body belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see this purposeful meditation? Everything around you has rights. Even the poor, they have rights over you. And in fact, when you give money to the poor or you donate to a project, be thankful to that poor. Be thankful to the project for allowing you to fulfill that right that's on you. You see the intellectual basis that the Imam salam gives us? That's the beauty of his spirituality. It's purposeful. It has a solid framework pegged in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't find that in those yoga exercises, my dear brothers and sisters. There's a lot of confusion there. You don't know what you're opening your brain to. So when we have the beauty of Imam Zain al-Abideen, why do you need to go elsewhere for spirituality? I know some of our youth and this saddens me. I see them seeking these spiritual ways when they have not opened a single page of a Sahif as sajjadiyah Not a single page of Rasalat al huquq Allah has given you this treasure. Allah has given you this gift. Benefit from this gift. Subhanallah, look at the 15 munajat of Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam. Each one of them describes an emotional state that we go through. If you feel scared, you feel concerned, you feel insecure, Imam Zain al-Abideen gives you munajat al-kha'ifeen. This is the munajat when you're kha'if, when you're scared, when you're frightened. And then there are sometimes when you feel the love in your heart, the Imam salam gives you munajat al-muhibbeen. That's how you develop the love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then sometimes you have the feeling of being grateful to Allah. The Imam salam gives you munajat al-shakirin. Look at all these states and feelings that we go through. The Imam gives you a spiritual, beautiful meditation to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is amazing spirituality, my dear brothers and sisters that you cannot find anywhere out there in society let's appreciate our imam even even these physical practices i'm a firm believer that anything that's beneficial to the human being even physically comes from the ahlul bayt they've taught that today even the first type of yoga which we said okay we cannot object to right the breathing exercises the postures Subhanallah, look at Imam Zain al Abidin. Even the breathing, he teaches you how to breathe properly. One of his servants, he says, Once I was following Ali ibn al Hussein, Zain al Abidin, he was in the desert. I did not know where he was. I went after him. I saw him in the state of sujood. And he was gasping for air, crying and gasping for air. That's a breathing exercise the Imam was doing. And I heard him say the following phrase 1,000 times. I stood there to count. I counted 1,000 times. And the Imam with a deep breath, with tears, he would say, La ilaha illallah haqqan haqqa. La ilaha illallah ta'abbudan wa riqqa. La ilaha illallah imanan wa sidqa. There is no God but Allah in truth, in truth. You see this meditation with a breathing exercise that comes with it? There is no God but Allah ta'abbudan wa riqqa. I am his servant. He owns me. This is purposeful meditation. La ilaha illallah imanan wa sidqa. This is my faith. This is the truth. You see this beautiful exercise that the Imam salam was doing. It's a breathing exercise. But many of us don't even pay attention to that. You feel down. You feel anxious. You feel depressed. I guarantee you, if this does not work, come tell me, Sayyid, you're wrong. That's how confident I am. Go into sujood for 10 minutes. With a deep breath, say the words of Imam Zayn al Abidin salam. Say, La ilaha illallah haqqan haqqa. La ilaha illallah ta'abbudan wa riqqa. La ilaha illallah imanan wa sidqa. Say these words. Tell me if you don't feel a burden lifted from your chest. Tell me if you don't feel more spiritual in those moments. And the Imam alayhi salam, you know, we have different postures, the child posture, other different types of poses. The Imam gives you the best pose. The best posture to be in is sujood. 
Sujood is one of the miracles of Islam, my dear brothers and sisters, and the Abrahamic faiths. And that's why the hero of tonight is called as sajjad the excessive prostrator. When you analyze sujood from a scientific perspective, we are truly mesmerized. The only natural position where your heart is higher than your brain is sujood. Think of a person who's doing sujood. When you go into your sujood, your heart is elevated more than your brain. What does that do scientifically? That pumps blood directly to your brain such that one doctor states the prostration pose is a beautiful way to massage your brain, subhanAllah. Because you have that pressure on your forehead where you do the sujood. And you've got that extra blood coming directly towards your brain with gravity. It's pulling it towards your brain. That is a beautiful way to relax. It's a beautiful exercise of massaging the brain. And that's the beauty of sujood. This is the spirituality that Imam gives you. You want meditation? You want a nice pose? You want breathing? Just do what Ali ibn al-Husayn alayhi did and see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will connect your heart to his goodness in the universe. So let's not forget these beautiful exercises that we learn from our fourth Imam alayhi salam. And then when you read the beautiful points in Sahifa al-Sajjadiyya, my dear brothers and sisters, every page is a university. In as sahif as sajjadiyah That's the type of meditation that we engage in. I'll give you some quick examples. Yesterday we spoke about parenting, right? And what modern society is doing to our children and how we have to be careful. The Imam alayhi salam has a dua. Read it with contemplation, with meditation. Take a deep breath, read line by line. It will change your life. It's about parents. Yesterday we spoke about children. This dua is how children deal with parents. See how the Imam alayhi salam describes the rights of our parents and how we should view them. The Imam begins this beautiful supplication by saying, Oh Allah, give me the science of how to deal with my parents and how to treat them. The Imam calls it a ilm. وَجْمَعْ ذَلِكَ كُلَّهُ لِي Oh Allah, I want you to give me that science and I don't want to miss any parts of it. Give me the full science. My dear brothers and sisters, where today in society you find an institution that talks about you treating your parents as being a science? Look at the vision of the Imam Ali salam. Don't underestimate it. Don't say, yeah, I'm just treating my parents in this way. I'm just serving them. The Imam says, this is a science. Just like you study chemistry, study the science of how you should be with your parents. Just like you study biology, this is a science that's more important than these other sciences. Subhanallah. Look at the perspective that the Imam alayhi salam gives you. And then the Imam transitions into emptying your heart for your parents and to soften your hearts. Sometimes we have difficulty with our parents as they age. There are some misunderstandings. The Imam says, Oh Allah, make my service to my parents more pleasing to me, more joyful to me than when I am drowsy and I crave that sleep. You know how your eyes sometimes like a magnet, they pull you towards sleep. The Imam describes this moment. He says, just as my eyes demand sleep when I'm tired, oh Allah, I want you to make serving my parents more pleasing to my eyes than that. Look at these amazing words by the fourth Imam of Ahlul Bayt. And then the Imam alayhi salam states, and make my services to them more pleasing to my heart and chest than the one who is dying from thirst. He's burning from the inside and he quenches his thirst with a cold cup of water. How does that feel? Oh Allah, make me feel that way when I serve my parents. Where do you find words like that in our society today? That's amazing meditation. That's purposeful meditation. When you read these du'as, read them with meditation, not just trying to finish them. The problem that we have is we're just trying to finish many of the du'as that we have, right? Next month, the Shahar Ramadan is going to come and we're just trying to finish these du'as. Use the breathing exercises of Ahlul Bayt. Take it step by step. Breathe properly and then read 
passages of the dua. You don't have to finish the whole dua. Some people think, you know, that if I don't finish the dua the entire month of Ramadan every night, my iman is, uh, you know, missing something. Yes, as a community, we gather, we read the full dua. But each person has their own experience. Read some passages, let those interact with you. I, I know there was a brother who would recite dua al-Joshan, and he couldn't concentrate throughout the whole dua. It's a hundred verses, it's a lot. It takes an hour or two sometimes. So towards the end of the dua, you know, when you say al-Ghawth, al-Ghawth, khallisna min al-Nar, ya Rab, he kept yelling, Al-Ghawth, Al-Ghawth, Khalisna min Dua Al-Shawjoshan, Ya Rab. <laughs> oh Allah, save me from Dua Al-Joshan. <laughs> Sometimes we burden ourselves because we don't understand what this Dua is, what type of meditation it is. Take two lines of it and open your heart and see how it interacts with you. It's about quality, not quantity. That's what the Imams, alayhi salam, teach us. In Najil Balagha, Amir al-Mu'mineen gives us a beautiful recipe. He says the pious ones, the believers, the muttaqeen, at night, when the night sets, they stand on their two feet. At night, you see them standing on their feet, reciting parts of the Qur'an. At night, when you read the Qur'an, stand on your feet. Imagine it's the day of judgment, oh Allah, it's Qiyamah and I'm standing. Just visualize that, that will change your life, even if you do that for two minutes. That's purposeful meditation. The Imam says they make themselves sorrowful. Beautiful words from Amir al muminin He says from the Quran, they take the medicine of the Quran and they put it on the disease of their hearts. Allahu Akbar. Look at the description of Amir al muminin And then the Imam takes it a level higher. He says then when it comes to the Akhirah, فَهُمْ وَالْجَنَّةُ كَمَنْ قَدْ رَآهَا فَهُمْ فِيهَا مُنَعَّمُونَ When it comes to heaven, the believers, the pious ones, they see heaven from dunya. They see Jannah from this dunya. They visualize it. And then when it comes to hell, وَهُمْ وَالنَّارُ كَمَنْ قَدْ رَآهَا فَهُمْ فِيهَا مُعَذَّبُونَ They can feel the heat of hell from this dunya. That's where medication takes you. That's where purposeful meditation leads you to. Where the akhirah, you have so much yaqeen towards the akhirah, you can feel heaven from dunya and you can feel the fire of hell from dunya. Look at the description of Amir al muminin Which yoga class teaches you that? Show me. When you have the spiritual school of Ahl al-Bayt, why do you need to go here and there? Why do you need to go to others for spirituality? Again, I don't want my words to be misunderstood. There are certain practices, breathing exercises. That's okay, fine, you can go there. Learn a new stretch, that's fine. But if you're looking for spirituality, only knock on the door of Ahl al-Bayt They give you the most beautiful spirituality. And that is the most beautiful lesson that we learn from our beloved Imam, Al-Imam Zain al-Abideen salawatullahi alayhi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our hearts for His guidance. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to inspire us with the spirituality of Al-Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam. Raise your hands in dua. This is the moment of dua. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. نسألك اللهم باسمك العز الجل الأكرم يا الله يا الله يا الله يا الله يا الله اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من أنصاره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه اللهم اشفي كل مريض اللهم اقضي دين كل مدين اللهم غير سوء حالنا بحسن حالك اللهم ارزقنا زيارة علي بن الحسين اللهم ارزقنا شفاعة علي بن الحسين 
My dear brothers and sisters, it has been my great honor to be amongst you these past three nights as we celebrated the beautiful Sha'bani births. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all, protect you all. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward all of you for your participation, for the organizers, for the volunteers. These are the beautiful majalis of Ahlul Bayt alayhimussalam that we always must uphold for the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be multiplied for us. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect you all and I ask you to keep me also in your du'as. Let's recite Surah Al-Fatiha on the souls of all of your marhumin. بعد الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد. اللهم صل على محمد. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. الحمد لله رب العالمين. الرحمن الرحيم. مالك يوم الدين. إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين. دنا الصراط المستقيم. صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين. And inshallah, the thunderstorm will make it more memorable that we talked about yoga tonight. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is for you. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Mufajali Muhammad. Se kay gay. فاجوال محمد سے کر گئے ہوتے علی کو مولا جو کہتے سدھے گئے نہ گھر بطول کا چلتا نہ کربلا ہوتی اگر یہ تینوں ہی بچپن میں مر گئے عشق خیدر اگھر ملا خوتا عشق خیدر ملا ہوتا مشکلوں سے نہ سامنا ہوتا یا علی یا علی علی مولا یا علی یا علی 
علی مولا یہ سبق کاش پڑھ لیا ہوتا داغ داغ ماتم اگر نہیں ہوتے کیسے جنت میں داخلہ ہوتا اور تم پہ تم پہ پرتی نلانت اتنی اتنی حق جو زہرا کا دے دیا ہوتا عشق حیدر سنو عرش والو سنو فرش والو میں سہرا علی کا سنانے چلا ہوں سنو عرش والو سنو فرش والو میں سہرا علی کا پر ہوں تیرے دادا کی شادی کا منظر اے میرے امام زمانہ مدد کر تصور میں ہر ایک مومن محب کو تصور میں ہر ایک مومن محب کو علی کا براتی بنانے چلا ہوں سنو فرش والو میں سہرا علی کا سنانے خدا کہتا ہو اگر ہوتا کعبہ میرے گھر سے ہی جاتی بارات اس کی یہ میرا ولی ہے سو اس کے لیے میں یہ میرا ولی ہے سو اس کے لیے میں مدینہ کو کعبہ بنانے چلا ہوں سنو عرش والو سنو فرش والو سب پرو میں سہرا علی کا سنانے چلا ہوں سنو عرش والو سنو 